This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast, part of the Seneca Network from the China Project. For everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level, you came to the right place. I'm your host, Jared Turner, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, longtime resident of China. And luckily, I feel really good about this. My chances are great for beating my gambling addiction. My co-host is John Passy, co-founder of Manor Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese grammar wiki, Sinospice.com. And as his grandpa always used to say, finding a needle in a haystack is quite easy if you set the hay on fire. Do you ever feel like natives speak Chinese too fast? John and I talk about the nuances of rate of speech and listening and how to increase your ability to listen to faster speech and even increase your own rate of speech. Guest interviews with Susan St. Dennis, who during her teens got hooked on Chinese, never looked back, and became determined to pursue a career connected to China. Let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Jared Turner coming at you from Utah here in the United States. Hey everybody out there, my name is John Pasden. I am based in Shanghai, China. How's it going? Hey John, thanks for not speaking too fast for me. You're welcome, Jared. Was my rate of speech comfortable for you there? Oh, it was quite comfortable. Indeed it was. It wasn't like you weren't speaking like motorboat fast. It was, you know... Tolerable. Okay, so that is our topic today. It is rate of speech. Normally not something you talk about between two native speakers of their native tongue, but something that is very relevant if you're learning a foreign language like Chinese. Absolutely. And, and it's one of these things of like anyone learning a second language at the beginning, it sounds like people speak very, very fast. Uh, but if you stop for a moment and take notice in your native language, you probably speak very fast compared to people who are just learning your language. Okay, so there are aspects of this topic, I think, that are kind of obvious, but there are a few things that I think are really worth talking about, both for beginners and for more advanced learners, and so we're going to cover four subtopics related to rate of speech. And the first one that we want to talk about is teachers. So obviously, you have a Chinese teacher, they're speaking to you in Chinese, the rate of speech in the very beginning and as it goes on, is an important part of your learning. Definitely. And this is something that's natural. Teachers obviously intuitively understand this. And they're going to speak to you a little bit slower in, in your language so that you can begin to grasp what they're talking about. Yeah, teachers need to speak slowly. You're still learning the sounds of the language. And to help you distinguish between similar sounds, they're going to speak slowly. And this is something actually that linguists have studied uh, there's this phenomenon called foreigner talk, and there's this other kind of similar one called motherese, like the way mothers talk to babies. And it's kind of this this built-in understanding that we need to talk differently for certain types of people. But I think we've all had the, the uh, situation where someone using their foreigner talk, they're just like yelling at you or something. Maybe they're yelling a little slowly. Uh, it's not always helpful. So a teacher who's good at it is going to be super helpful. So, John, just to clarify, foreigner talk, is this someone, how they're speaking to a foreigner or a foreigner speaking to a native? So this is the way that a native speaker speaks in their native tongue to a foreigner who does not speak that native tongue well. <laughs> very good. And, and hopefully it is very good. If I, Actually, last podcast, I specifically brought up a gripe about this. Some guy in a pitch contest for his new startup, he was talking about how he was in Korea and he was teaching English and he was speaking to this guy very slowly and clearly, but he didn't really talk about what words he was actually using. So that's an important aspect, right? Right. So let's talk a little bit more about what teachers do uh, with their rate of speech when they, when they teach well. Right, so one one thing that you talk about a lot, I think, um, with learning Chinese is that you don't want too much English for too long. You want to quickly phase out the English and do your lesson entirely in Chinese, because there are some cases where there's like way too much English for way too long and it slows you down. So the same thing is kind of applicable to rate of speech. If the teacher starts out speaking slowly, then that's expected, that's normal. But as you improve, it should start to speed up and to approach natural and then by the time you hit you know intermediate it should be pretty natural um, i've run into a few cases where people have gotten used to a teacher who for whatever reason just never sped up like i talked to this guy and he's like yeah um 
I'm at an intermediate level, but when I talk to, to your teacher, they speak so fast. And, well, maybe not fast, but my teacher always just spoke so slowly and clearly. And and I listened to the recording, and I was like, that's not fast. That's kind of normal. Maybe slightly on the slow side of normal. And so the problem was he felt like he was intermediate in most areas, but he was not intermediate in rate of speech. And so that's something that the teacher really needs to um, you know help the student with. I think it's good to point out here is that this is something that's usually controlled by the teacher. So, you know, you may consider, you know, if you have a tutor or something, sometimes if you're in a, like a class in school, it's a little bit harder to you maybe, uh, you know, in, influence this. But you can talk to the teacher and say, hey, could you speak a little faster? Uh, you know, or maybe just pat push us or challenge us a little bit more. Because um, one it's one of these things about like w- that rate of speech, if they are speaking, and I think, John, the example you just shared is that they're just used to it, right? Right. But they can also get used to just a little faster, uh, especially if they, if, in, in the example you gave, if someone is maybe more at an intermediate level, but they're just still not used to hearing, you know, someone speak a little faster. That That's just about, you know, the habit. Okay, maybe you're not used to speaking someone a little faster, but you can. You can get used to that, and you can get better at that. So, But we're, we're going to get into this, of course. And if you ever feel like maybe my teacher could be speaking a little faster, then they're almost certainly speaking too slowly. Because if they're speaking at the proper rate of speech, it's going to challenge you occasionally. And, and that's okay, and that's normal. But if it's never challenging you, and everything is super comfortable, well, you're probably a little too comfortable. So just keep that in mind. And that's something that teachers are usually very open to feedback about, because it's, it's not easy. You know, especially if the teacher has lots of different students, and they're all at different levels, and they have to constantly you know, change their rate of speech. It's not easy for a teacher to keep track of that sometimes, so just give them a little reminder. The next point is other learning materials that you might have access to. Now, there's a wide variety of things out there ranging everything from like videos, audio, listening, podcasts. Um, you know, there's, there's a huge gambit of things out there. And there are going to be all sorts of different shades of speaking rates. So from very, very slow up to like uh, home shopping network fast. Yeah, and what is good to stick with for these rates of speech for these materials is various shades of natural. And what I mean by that is you can speak naturally but still speak slowly like what I'm doing right now in English. And you can speak pretty quickly but it's still pretty natural, right? But when you slow down this much, it's not natural, right? So the important thing is that it's natural. I remember when I was at Chinese Pod and I was uh, setting the standards for the different levels. We had a bunch of teachers on our team and we had a lot of conversations about what is the appropriate rate of speech for the dialogues which serve as the main material for the audio lesson. And what we eventually decided on was that the lowest level called newbie would be the slowest natural speed So some people think it's a little unnatural, but you want it to try to be slow but still natural. And then as you get to intermediate, it becomes kind of medium natural, right? But what you don't want is when it's super unnatural and there's like these crazy pauses um, because it's just too unlike natural language. Yeah, there's one thing in speech is just at the cadence, right? It's it's like at the flow. Is it is it going there versus something really broken up and stilted? And so I think John, you gave some great examples there in your speech, right? If it is really broken up, and I have heard some Chinese that is that slow, and it's kind of yeah, you're right. It's very unnatural. So one thing that is relevant to both this input and the teacher's rate of speech is the issue of pauses. So your input shouldn't have these unnatural pauses that breaks up the cadence, right? It should be more natural. And when a teacher talks to you, their rate of speech is important, but they'll also sometimes need to pause to give you a second to process. So when it comes to your input, you're not normally going to have those pauses that you have in a face-to-face conversation. So it's important for it to be natural, but at a good speed for you. And then you can just keep listening to it if you have to, right? So those two are a little bit different in terms of pauses, but um, you want it to be as natural as possible. Some people don't like the speech to be on the slow side, even in the very beginning, because they just want to, I don't know, they want to challenge themselves. They want to 
They want to hear it like it really is, you know. But you definitely don't want it to be super unnatural and then get used to that. Because remember, you're progressing towards a, a natural rate of speech. All right. So the third point is using software to slow down speech. Now, there's a lot of stuff out there that can actually slow it down or even speed it up and sound pretty you know, good and don't make it sound like you're a demon you know, voice or a chipmunk voice. Uh, you know, YouTube, even, you know, you can play back videos, you know, at double, you know, or slower speeds. How about using this, John, to adapt audio to a rate of speech that's more comfortable for you? Well, this is a little tricky. You kind of have to take it on a case-by-case basis. Because if you're, say you're talking about like some kind of news story or something, and the speed is way too fast for you, so you want to slow it down. Okay, but what about the vocabulary and the grammar? Is that also too hard for you? Because it just sounds like it's just too hard for you. If the speed is the only thing and just slowing it down a little bit is really going to help you, then that seems okay, but I think that's going to rarely be the case. Like usually if the speed is too much, it's going to be multiple issues. But if there's some special reason why you need to study this one thing, you know, you want to memorize this scene from this movie or your teacher recorded this speech for you that you have to learn, but she was in a rush and she did it so fast, you know, something like that. Well, then, you know, on a one-off thing where you really need to learn it, it does make sense. Um, But it's just not something you want to get in the habit of doing all the time because, you know, you want to build up to that natural speed, Um, whether it's a speech or, you know, a video or news or any of that. You know, I think one aspect of what you mentioned, you kind of touched on there, John, which I think can be really helpful is that when you are listening to something and it's just, especially there's a part there where like they said something really fast or you just didn't quite grasp what it was, you know, that can be helpful at that point to, you know, really kind of slow that down, maybe unpack it a little bit and be like, oh, that's what it is. And one thing nice, one nice thing about that is sometimes you can like, oh, that's also how I can say it. Because we had talked about cadence, right? And, and you're listening uh, in something you're listening to. But there's a cadence as well in your speech when you're speaking and so- sounding maybe fluid. And all languages, you know, when you're speaking faster, sometimes things can kind of, you know, muddle together a little bit or kind of just flow together. And this can be one of those opportunities for you to kind of dissect that and understand, you know, how you can say things in a, in a maybe more fluid way. That's a good point, Jared. That that's called elision in linguistics. And like I'll give a I'll give an example of that. So if I'm speaking slowly and clearly, I might ask shao qian, like how much, right? But if I'm speaking quickly and not enunciating well, I'll be like duo qian, right? And it the like the shao just kind of goes away. So you're like duo qian. And um when you hear that and it's fast, you might not even understand it. And when you slow it down, you might still not understand it, but at least you know that it's not just because it's too fast, it's because something else is going on. And then that's the kind of thing that after you slow it down and you're sure of what you heard, you can take that to your teacher and your teacher can help you figure it out. You know, I could liken this a little bit to uh, Chinese characters. You know, uh, handwriting characters, oh my goodness, it's so hard. <laughs> me to like read a Chinese person's handwritten characters because, you know, they kind of have this way of, you know, out of a, what we would say, a cursive style. They, they kind of flow together uh, as opposed to if they're printed. Or even if it is a Chinese learner writing hand, handwriting characters, almost time, even if they're like not good, I can almost read those better than I can read a, a Chinese person's handwriting. Yeah. So it's just the audio version of that. So it does happen. And again, um, being able to slow something down can help you recognize that. Okay. So let's move on to the last one. And the last point, and that is, well, what about rate of speech and improving your fluency? Because I've talked to a lot of people who have gotten to a pretty good level with their Chinese, and now they're kind of feeling like, maybe I just talk too slow. Maybe my Chinese would be better if I just talk faster. And I feel like I've I've felt that myself at times. Uh, what about you, Jared? Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I guess, and we'll get into the, like, this is what we're going to get into, right? But I, I think it's really when it's something I know what I'm talking about, or I'm familiar with the topic, or I've, I'm, I have the vocabulary for this conversation. Yeah, it can go pretty fluid. You know, I can speak pretty fast, but maybe if it's not, ah, it's a little slower. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. If you want to speed up your rate of speech, 
that can make you appear more fluent and it can impress native speakers more, but you have to have good pronunciation. You have to have good tones. And I, I keep running into people from time to time who have this theory that like, oh, Chinese people don't really pronounce their tones very clearly. They just talk really fast and the tones just kind of go away. All right. Uh, don't don't fall for this this uh, this Not idea. True. It's true that the tones change a little bit when when they start speaking quickly. But as a non-native speaker, you're you're not a master of that in the way that a native speaker is. So you really have to focus on the tones first. And once you're you're confident in your tones and your pronunciation, then it's okay to start improving the speed, and and that will get some good results sometimes. Hey, specifically on this, John, you know a little bit more about this than what you're saying, because that you you published an article on your uh, Sino Splice a decade of plus ago about this, right? Um, and I thought it was super fascinating and interesting. I like this little dynamic of native speakers actually sloughing off tones versus actually pronouncing them, right? Oh, yeah, so that, that article was called like Toward Better Tones in Natural Speech, and it was based on a talk given by a Chinese professor at an actual conference. And so their main point was, when native speakers speak quickly, the tones are not quite as pronounced except for certain words that they're emphasizing where the tone is, is you know, much more pronounced. And I think that's the kind of thing where you can see it when you're observing native speakers, but if you try to actually study it, it's pretty hard to do. So it's better to just learn the pronunciation well, do your best to imitate native speakers, and eventually you will, you will start doing something similar. Uh, I don't think you want to just like aim for that. Yeah, it's something that I think comes with experience, right? It's just that's that's about we talk about the you know the feel of the language that you got, right? It's just how the language kind of comes out. Does it feel right? Does it sound right to you? Uh, and so that's yeah, it's not a. I think maybe it's an beginning intermediate maybe you can start getting into some of that but it's, it's more of an advanced uh, i think technique All right, but there is a technique that some people have used with great um success which is called shadowing and that's where you you play audio and you try to speak with it so you don't have to memorize it but it kind of helps to memorize it and you try to speak at exactly the same rate of speech matching intonation tones everything and you could possibly slow down the audio for this if you if it's really difficult, but if you can get it at the natural speed and you're like pronouncing it over top of the audio like in unison, then that kind of practice can help. But I don't think you have to do that, and I know a lot of people don't want to do that. Like I, I never really did much of that. I have seen some videos of uh, you know this technique being practiced. So one comes to mind is uh, Steve Kaufman. We had him on the podcast. Uh, uh, we replayed his interview, I think, this last year, uh, but he speaks like 20 languages, and he's specifically talking about shadowing, and he was learning Arabic, and uh, and he, he was kind of demonstrating, you know, for, for him. And I, I think, you know, shadowing, you don't necessarily have to have a transcript of what's being said. You can just try to listen and, and, and repeat, and, yeah, and what he had suggested is that, you know, he— Sometimes even for him, after getting in 30 seconds, he's kind of starts to get lost, you know. But you go back and you listen to it and you get a little more practice on it. And, oh, okay, so you start getting familiar with flowing those words together, the cadence, right, we're talking about, a lot of these things. And that's going to be a great way to, yeah, improve your listening and also your speaking rate of speech. And actually for shadowing, um, some of our readers use our our books to to practice shadowing. So you can get the audio book. And then you have the book there and, you know, the vocabulary is all pretty easy for you. So just practicing saying it, you know, and at the same rate of speech and you can even speed it up if you want to. Yeah, I think that's actually a good thing to mention because, you know, the Manor Companion series is a graded reader series. And in doing shadowing, it's definitely going to be helpful if whatever it is you're listening to, you actually can comprehend what's being said. So, um, I mean... If if you don't know what's really being said, you it's going to be really hard to shadow, right? Uh, I mean, there could be some things you maybe some words here and there. So yeah, having a graded reader and practicing shadowing with that, bam, that that's a great way, great place to start. Yeah, but the goal for shadowing is it's something that you can comprehend, but you would struggle to produce it at that same that same rate, and it doesn't have to be long. You know, you can do it in sentence chunks or whatever. You can do it in longer chunks if you want, um, but it has to be something that you understand but you would struggle to produce smoothly, you know, at that rate of speech. 
So it works at all levels. You're just going to have to find the right material for it. Okay, but on this topic of uh, you know fluency and perceived fluency, I, I said earlier that if you can get your tones right, you have good pronunciation, and you increase your rate of speech, it can make you seem more more fluent. But you know, as a native speaker of English, when I speak English, I don't always speak super quickly. Sometimes I speak, I don't know, not quite slow, but not super fast. So thinking about it that way, why should I speak Chinese more quickly than I speak English? I, I might sometimes be putting pressure on myself to speak Chinese more quickly, but that's just not my style. That's not really who I am. So I find that it's a lot more natural and it makes a lot more sense if someone already speaks really quickly in their native tongue, they would want to be able to speak quickly in Mandarin as well. So think about your personality as well. And if you do speak quickly in your native tongue and you can't speak quickly in Mandarin, that probably drives you just a little bit crazy. So um, that might be something that you're shooting for long term. But overall, and we're talking about rate of speech here, the, the key point is being able to communicate. So if you are speaking slow and if someone has to speak slow for you, um, are you communicating? Uh, that, that I think is the first thing. Uh, but obviously, the, the more you're going to be able to increase your rate. But obviously, if you can understand people speaking at a faster rate of speech, you're going to be a little more versatile in the type of situations you'd be able to function with your Chinese. And obviously, speaking as well, that provides a little more opportunities to maybe get your point across a little faster and people to, you know, it's, it's, it's nicer if someone's not speaking really slow to you sometimes. Uh, it just feels more natural. So whether you're a beginner thinking about your teacher's rate of speech or the rate of speech of the input you're studying from or whether you're thinking about using software slow down or maybe taking your Chinese to the next level by increasing your own rate of speech, um, hopefully we've given you a little bit to think about and uh, this is something applicable to all levels and it can really help your Chinese. All right, now it's time for a word from our sponsor. And today our sponsor is Mandarin Companion, Chinese graded readers. These are easy to read Chinese novels. And today we are talking about My Teacher is a Martian. It's a Mandarin Companion breakthrough level book using only 150 basic characters. So unlike a lot of our stories, this is actually an original story. Uh, Jared borrowed an idea from a, a book from his childhood, but it is an original story that we developed together. And it is in a Chinese context, Chinese characters, and yet with only 150 characters, and we're very strict about this, you can read the entire story. Yes, it's a great story. It's actually our second best-selling novel, right? Crazy stuff. But uh, these two kids are convinced that their teacher is a Martian because he does all sorts of crazy, strange, weird stuff and seems to know a lot about Mars. Is he a Martian? There is only one way to find out, folks. And John, we might have to do a sequel to this. We continue to get emails about this. We will do a sequel <laughs> to this. We will. It has to be good, though. So think Avatar 2. So you can go out and get it today. It's My Teacher is a Martian. It's available on Amazon, iBooks, Kobo, or wherever you get your books. Check it out, guys. We think you like it. All right, now it's time for Rants and Raves. John, what do you have for us today? Do you have a rant or do you have a rave? I have a rant. Sorry, I'm going negative again. Yeah, I was just thinking about characters recently. And I really like characters. They're, they're one of the, the things about Chinese that attracted me in the very beginning, and I still like them. And yet, there are some things I don't like. And um, so there are some characters which I think of as low ROI characters. So ROI is return on investment, right? It's a, it's a term that entrepreneurs like to use. And there are some characters where in order to... I'm oh, sorry. And there are some words where in order to be able to read and write this word, you have to learn two characters which basically never show up in any other word. And um, this is something that I became very familiar with you know, as the editor for our for our stories, because I want to avoid these these words in our in our in our uh, adaptations, because they're not very compatible with the idea of a low character count. So, for example, in the Secret Garden, there's a key, and this word key in Chinese is yao shi, and both of the characters 
and this word key are are relatively uncommon, but you need both of them in order to write mm-hmm. this word. And so there are other words like this. There's quite a bunch, and they're quite common when you get into like names of bugs and animals, like some of the rarer ones. And a lot of those have phonetic borrowings. But still, it annoys me. It's like, man, why do I have to learn two characters for one word? Yeah, so that's my rant. Thanks, Chinese. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. What were you guys thinking when you're made of this character made of this language? All right. <laughs> Someone needs to be fired over this. All right, so so Jared, uh, rant or rave? Um, I have a rave, and our rave is compatible with our podcast today. Uh, so I have been playing around with a bunch of AI tools. I mean, everyone's Ooh. been messing around with chat GDP and be like, oh, can I learn Chinese? Uh, a, a side note on this, I, I uh, someone uh, I, in our WeChat group had uh, had asked chat GDP to write an original article by John Pasden in his own style about like you know, learning Chinese. It was pretty funny. Anyway, did pretty good. What did you think about that one, John? Did it do good? It was all right. Was Not as good as the real too. thing, but you know, it was all right. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, John. Come on. Anyway, so but uh, some of the tools that I have been playing around with are text to speech, and it's pretty cool stuff out there. Now, I am not going to recommend a specific website because this stuff is developing so fast that by the website I give you or the the ones I've checked out, they're probably going to be you know somewhat obsolete within you know six months, or there's going to be better ones that are coming out. Uh, but if you just search Chinese text to speech then you're going to find a bunch of sites where you can actually take some Chinese text, put it in there, and it'll spit out uh, some you know audio for you, uh, some in audio files. And there's a lot of free stuff out there. Now, the re- reason I mention it, because that stuff's been around for a while, but there are some stuff that sounds like pretty natural. Uh, they have, you know, caricatures of voices and stuff you can listen to, the different style of it. And you can, a man's, a woman's voice with the, all sorts of different, you know, whatever it is. Um, and it's pretty cool. And there are even some other services out there where you can now register a voice print so you could take a audio recording of a person or something and it can create that as a persona for a voice and you can then have that person use that person's voice to you know create some audio from some text that you put into the put in the platform so this is a pretty cool thing um and you can adjust of course rates of speech as we're just if you've learned anything from the topic today, don't go too slow. Um, but it's a great opportunity to actually get some real, you know, some more audio input from maybe some stuff that you can comprehend that you might have in text. Cool stuff. But you know what I realized about this, John? What? I got enough audio recording of you. I could create your own persona and script out your point and knock you off. Oh. And do the podcast without you. But you're there anyway. Oh. <laughs> I could do the same thing, Jared. You you need to do a search for you can learn Chinese too, Jared. You don't even know what I've already done. Wahaha. My name is Susan St. Dennis. I work with the China Project, which is an amazing organization that reports on China with neither fear nor favor. As many of you know, this podcast is part of the Seneca Podcast Network by the China Project. After I learned a bit about Susan, I knew we had to get her on the show. I help them with their newsletter editing, and I'm also in charge of their TikTok. So I make videos on TikTok teaching people about China, Chinese politics, news, history, culture, you name it. I'm your go-to gal. Susan was a competitive swimmer in high school, and just like a swimmer, she dives headfirst into life, sticking with tenacity to whatever she sets her mind to do, especially when it involves career pursuits involving China. Stay with us. All right, Susan, why did you start learning Chinese? I have a really interesting journey when it comes to Chinese. So my dad, he traveled to China throughout the 1980s and 90s. He was an English teacher, a law professor. I got to ask this. What was he doing (laughs) in China in the 80s? There were just not a lot of people there in China. So I got to hear about this. What (laughs) took him to China? Why was he going there? Basically, at one point, he was working with Rhodes Scholars, and that brought him to Hong Kong. And then he was working with a program for youth development, helping young people get into business. And then he started teaching law at a university in Tianjin. And 
while he was at Tianjin, he was not only teaching, he was also working and doing missionary work. So it was all kinds of things that were going on. He actually was there right after Tiananmen Square was when he was teaching. Oh, wow. So very interesting time. And he absolutely loved it. He had a grand old time. Then he came back to the U.S., met my mom, married her. Four months after they were married, he takes her to China, where my mom was an English teacher in 1994, and my dad was teaching law again at Tianjin. So talk about a test of marriage. My my dad had a great time, but my mom got horrifically <laughs> sick the whole time. So oh, no. the photos that they took, oh my gosh, my mom, I always tell her she looks gorgeous, but she was very sick for most of the time. So some of the pictures, she looks oh, no. very tired and just like... I'm having a great time. I love it. Thank you, honey, for taking me here. She thought they were going to go to Paris or something. My dad takes her to a little fishing area in Tianjin <laughs> instead. Oh, man. Wow. Did he speak any Chinese? So this is what's funny. He picked up a little bit of it. But my dad was like a six foot five blonde swimmer dude just wandering through China with no language experience. Yeah. So like an anomaly, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Very weird. <laughs> Stood out like a sore thumb. He picked up a little bit, though, and would often embarrass me and my siblings by speaking Chinese to anyone who possibly could be Chinese when we were in the States. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. That's a risky proposition. (laughs) Oh, man. Thankfully, my dad is such a warm, friendly personality. It would normally be fine. But time and time again, we would be at swim meets, and there would be a family behind us. My dad would whip around and speak Chinese to them, and they'd be like... We're from Utah. We don't speak any Chinese. (laughs) And my dad be like, oh, no worries. But he made a lot of friends through that. So when I got into high school was when I actually started studying for real. The high school that I went to had a lot of international students. And many of them are from China. So a lot of people would send their kids over to my high school because it had one of the best swimming programs in the world. We had like Olympians coming out of our school. So that's a lot of Chinese swimmers would come and train with us. And this led to a really amazing Chinese program. So I was taking Latin. I hated it. I told my dad I wanted to study Japanese because I was a little weeaboo and I liked anime. (laughs) And my dad goes, no, you're not learning Japanese. That's not going to help you at all. I want you to learn Chinese so that you can go into the world of business and make a ton of money. My dad was paying my tuition, so I had no choice. And I loved it. My first year of Chinese, I fell madly in love with the language, and I went to China that summer with barely any experience with the language, and I just threw myself into a high school in China, in Qingdao. Was this an exchange program? Yeah, for a few months. It was awesome. Oh, wow. I got to hear a little more about this. First off, I have a couple (laughs) questions here. What was it that you just fell in love with? I just loved Chinese. What is it about it that drew you in? A lot of people when they're not experienced with Chinese and they just hear it, they assume that Chinese isn't a very romantic language. The languages that are presented as romantic tend to be languages like Spanish or French. But Chinese, once you really start studying it, is a beautiful literary language. There's so many ways to describe things. And it also makes it incredibly difficult to translate because of that. It's not so much a definition as it is an image that it paints in your mind. The language itself is a painting, which I really enjoyed. And being someone who is an artist myself, I grew up painting and I still paint to this day, I felt a connection with the way that you wrote Chinese. It was very easy for me to understand and pick up on because it's all about paint strokes. The language itself was representative of something. The word for sun looks like a sun. The word for mountain looks like a mountain, which worked perfectly for me. So I think on top of that, It was such a unique language for me to be studying. I had countless experiences where I really changed people's day. Like I made their day because I spoke Chinese. It just, it means a lot to people because it's such a difficult language and it takes a lot to try and study it. So you had that opportunity to go to Qingdao on this exchange with high school. Now tell me like how this even came (laughs) about because I'm gathering that you did not study much Chinese at this point, Right. right? Anyone who knows me knows that I tend to just jump into things. So I don't do a lot of research. If I see something that interests me, I just do it. And so that was exactly what happened with this program. It was through my high school. My school had a very Mm. close connection with this high school in Qingdao, and students had been going there for years. And so my teacher mentioned it as an aside, and I went home that day, and I said, Mom, Dad, I'm doing this. And they had no choice but to open up their wallets. Like, once my mind is set on something, they're like, (laughs) we're not going to dissuade her. 
I was 15 or 16 when I went. And I remember my mom was like, no, make sure that you text us. We want to make sure you're okay. I'm in Qingdao for two months, right? They get one text from me that whole time, one message. <laughs> it was in my first week in China, we went to Beijing. And there's this place in Beijing called the Night Market. It's a total tourist trap, but mm. it is also like I've a must. Been yeah. there. <laughs> so if there's another thing people should know about me is if you – if you give me money, I'll jump off a building. I'll take any bet. I love it. So my classmates found this out about me. And they're like, Susan, we'll give you money if you like eat weird stuff. <laughs> and and, so, and I, my teacher even gets in on it. She's like, I'll give you $10 for like everything that you eat if you give me proof that you did it. Going into it, I was like, oh, it's so crazy what I'm going to eat. But it actually was all really good. The scorpion, for example, <laughs> delicious. It tasted like Doritos. I loved it. The one thing I didn't like was silkworm pupa. It's a yeah, bug really gusher, not. which is a no-go. That was not, <laughs> didn't ex didn't like that. But anyway, the one text my parents get is a video of me at this night market, 15, 16 years old, surrounded by a bunch of like grown men who are like chanting, going, eat it, eat it. And I'm in the middle of the crowd with this giant scorpion. <laughs> oh, those black like ones? The size of my hand. Oh, yeah, it was huge. Oh, no. And I drop oh, the whole man. thing in my mouth and I eat it. And that's the only message my parents get for me the whole time i'm in china so oh man like, that was my poor mother i mean it's a miracle they even managed to get me at the airport i don't i can't believe i even remembered to text them my flight information uh. <laughs> but i landed my parents were like oh my gosh you're okay and i was like oh my gosh calm down it's not that big of a deal <laughs> If I would have seen one of my kids eating like a scorpion, I would have figured if they can do that, they're probably going to be able to handle themselves just they're fine. They're doing great. I really enjoyed going to school. It was interesting because it wasn't an international school at all. So I was the only American. So all the classes were in Chinese. Oh, yeah. Except for English class, of course. The English class was funny because... A lot of times I ended up being the English teacher. There was a couple of moments where I corrected things because the questions were wrong or the answers were incorrect, which got me in a lot of trouble. Don't correct your teachers in front of the class in China. Don't do that. <laughs> yes, yes. But what was I like? Because I had kids in local Chinese mm -hmm. schools back in Shanghai. And imagine you're probably in class. just woo, Most of it's going over your head. I mean, what do you feel like you gained in that period? Honestly... It's true that the information just went over my head. Out of all the classmates I went with, I was the lowest level. I could barely even say hello at that point. My other classmates were AP Chinese students, so they were fluent. So when I was sitting in the classes, honestly, the whole time I just ended up drawing and doodling, which led to me making a lot of friends. <laughs> so it's true I didn't understand a lot of what was happening in the classes. So I did not learn anything in the algebra class I was in while I was in China. But I made a lot of friends, which helped me better understand the culture and become more comfortable when people are studying abroad in a new country. There's a tendency to want to only stick with the people that are from where you're from, that speak your native language. And you tend to isolate yourself and end up in a bubble. I had no choice but to become friends with my Chinese classmates and move away from my American classmates because I couldn't speak any Chinese and they were the only ones who could help me. And even if my spoken Chinese still isn't great, I have a really good comprehension of body language or habits so I can pick up on what people are saying even if I don't know the words. I could observe them and know what was going on and get a grasp on the context of the conversation. I'm curious to know what happened after this because, all right, you, I'm going to take Chinese. All right, I'm going to China. <laughs> yeah, so I went to China that first time, and the whole flight back, I wept. So that you know how long the flight is from China to the U.S. Yeah. And I'm not even joking when I tell you, 16 or so hours, and I was crying. Wow. I felt like I had finally felt at home somewhere. I felt more at home there than I ever did back in the U.S. I had a really hard time socially in high school, but I actually fit in at the high school I was in at China. I didn't have the same social issues I did when I was in the US. And I knew on that flight that anything I did in my life, I had to get back to China. So at first, that dream was fashion design. I worked as a model and a runway coach for a time when I was in high school. And I just fell in love with fashion. So I started creating my own fashion brand. And the idea was I'd study Chinese in order to help me with purchasing fabrics. Shanghai was becoming a really big place to buy fabrics, mm -hmm. and Hong Kong was also growing in the fashion scene as well. But what happened, 
I go to college with this dream of becoming a fashion designer. And my freshman year, I took a class on German horror film. And I remember watching The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is this silent film from the German Expressionist era, and a light bulb went off. I was like, what am I doing? I don't want to do fashion design. I want to make movies. And I went home and I wrote a movie script that night. And I kept writing movie scripts and I was designing you know, movie posters. I was creating music for my films. I did short film after short film. I was making documentaries. I thought for sure I was doing film. And I continued studying Chinese because so much of Hollywood has Chinese investors. The idea mm-hmm. was I'd be able to speak Chinese and I wouldn't need yeah. a middleman. I could do it all myself. Well, I continued studying Chinese in undergrad and I went back to China. And this time I was in Pengshan. It's a district within Meishan, a city in Sichuan province. I was at Jinjiang College studying Chinese language and culture. And that was another two months. I get to my senior year of college And I apply to film school at Florida State University. It has one of the top film schools in the U.S. And I make it to the final 20. Only 15 people get in every year. I go to my final interview, and they tell me I was too aggressive. And so I wasn't accepted into the program. To be fair, I walked into the interview wearing a floor-length leather jacket. (laughs) So certainly sets off an impression. But... I was heartbroken. That was my entire future. Mm. That was like my key getting back with China. My vision at the time was that the way to improve U.S.-China relations was to have more Americans be watching Chinese films. That was where my head was at the time. I had been working on research on how Disney affected China's animation industry. I was determined to try and create this bridge within the film world. And that opportunity crumbled before my very eyes with that rejection letter. Well, my Chinese history professor brings me into his office and he says, Susan, you're an amazing writer. I think you have a passion for Chinese history. I think you're very talented. I want you to go get your master's degree in Chinese. I want you to move to Miami and go join this brand new program at Florida International University. I had nothing to lose. It was the middle of COVID. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. So I figured, why not? And maybe I can get this master's in Chinese and I can go back to film and I'll keep making documentaries on the side. Well, I start studying Chinese, I start getting my master's, and I get really into Chinese politics and law. And I start translating Chinese laws and experimenting with like language and trying to understand why these words were used in these laws and why these words weren't. And I fell in love with political studies. And I gave up on the film dream pretty much, and I moved straight into politics, and I started making videos on TikTok, teaching people about Chinese politics and law and what's going on in the country, and now I'm here working for the China Project, doing journalist work, and it's a long journey, but... (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. Well, I think something that's really interesting to me is this niche that you Mm -hmm. found. I've watched a lot of your videos, And you have, I think, a bit of a style that's easy to connect with and be able to digest some of these topics a bit easier. So maybe you could share with me a little bit like how you got started making these videos Mm. about Chinese politics. And it's a very difficult time Mm. for China's international relations with the West. For sure, for sure. So it's actually interesting. While I did move away from the film dream, I never lost that love for film. And so Originally, my TikTok was a comedy channel. So I did comedy sketches. And that got me about 60,000 followers. That got me my start. At one point, I think this was right when the movie Shang-Chi came out, which is the Marvel movie Mm -hmm. with Simu Liu. There was this whole controversy because in China, people were saying that Simu Liu wasn't attractive. And that news got over to the United States and Americans were like, what do you mean? This guy has like a six pack. He's gorgeous. What do you mean he's not attractive? So I made this whole video explaining why are Chinese people saying that Simu Liu isn't attractive and why aren't they connecting with the Shang-Chi movie? Where is this coming from? And that video blew up on TikTok. And it started a lot of controversy, a lot of people angry at me in the comments. But this led to me having more conversations with people. I started stitching comments and elaborating on my points, making more and more videos explaining some of the differences between American and Chinese interpretations of Chinese stories. 
And what's interesting is this actually led to me getting my master's thesis, which was on American cinematic interpretations of Mulan. Mm. So how do Americans differ from Chinese people in their interpretations of the Mulan story? But people were really interested in these perspectives because it had never been presented to them in such an easy to understand way. Normally, when people talk about these subjects, it's in a really long newspaper article or in a journal and it's just hard to understand mm -hmm. but here was this video where someone was explaining things in a very calm and casual manner it didn't feel like you had to be an intellectual to consume the content it was accessible and so from that video about shang chi i started to get more questions on politics and soon people were asking me what's the difference between the way that the american media talks about china versus chinese media talking about the united states or what does it mean that xi jinping is going in for a third term i heard that in china they're banning effeminate men from television is that true what does that mean and i was making these videos and i realized people have questions they want to understand more about china they're eager to learn but there's no one providing this content. There's no one who's making this accessible. And here we have an amazing opportunity to build a bridge, something I had always wanted to do, to help people better understand China, to facilitate conversations, and possibly improve relations with the younger generation. And I'm already starting to see that happen. I've been making those videos for two years. And it's absolutely amazing the bridges that have been built, the connections that I've made and the conversations that have been started and the narratives that have been shifted by the videos that I and a couple of my fellow creators have started making about China. It's exciting to be a part of. Well, that's really neat. Well, I'm curious to know from your experience, what are some of the most common misconceptions that people might have about mm. China or Chinese culture, or politics, whatever it be? The big one, I think, is China's development. When I first went to China, I thought that I was going to lose a bunch of weight because there wasn't going to be a lot of food because the China I knew about was the China my dad lived in, in the 80s. Mm. And he also lived in very rural parts of China. I had a very skewed image when I went to China, and that was blown out of the water the moment I entered the country, as I'm sure you probably experienced as well. Same thing, yep. Yeah. So the second time I went, I made a couple of documentaries showing how much China had changed from the 80s and 90s, and I brought those back and I showed them to my family, and they were shocked. They had understood China to be a third world country. The content that I showed them completely completely changed their perspectives. They had never seen that side of China before. So I think that's the first one. People still tend to think that China is behind on a lot of things when it comes to development. For sure, the country is still developing. But you'll go to places like Chongqing, and you'll see this crazy big city that doesn't look like anything you've ever yeah. seen before. Regarding politics, I think a lot of people are immediately frightened by Chinese politics, intimidated by Chinese politics, and they assume the worst. So the CPC is often illustrated as... Just for listeners, CPC, Chinese Communist Party. I know it's common parlance, but, you know, let's throw that out there, right? Yeah, just to explain, I say CPC, the normal English translation is CCP, but there's a push for people to start using CPC. My perspective is if China wants people to say CPC, I'll say CPC. I don't think it's a big linguistic difference, translation difference. And I find that people, especially from China, are more open to talk to me once I use CPC. So people tend to illustrate the CPC as always the bad guy. For sure, there are policies that aren't great. There are things about the CPC that I don't agree with. But there have been positive changes enacted by the party. There have been interesting policies put in place, experimental policies put in place that we should take the time to understand and analyze and know that it's not always the worst thing ever. It's not always malicious. There are issues, but there's also positives that have happened. And it's important for us to understand the good and the bad for us to get the holistic picture of China. At the moment, we tend to just illustrate China as an absolute bad because we need to have an enemy of sorts. It helps with narratives. But the world doesn't work like that. And China is far more complex than people give it credit for. So when it comes to politics, I think people are often surprised to see the range that happens within Chinese politics, the discussions that do happen, the experimentation that happens. And 
my videos help people better understand those things. I do know it's common in political discourse to reduce whoever may be your opponent or even ally into a single caricature, right? Even some family members, it's China, is it good or bad? My answer is yes. (laughs) (laughs) But how do you approach someone and engage Mm -hmm. in maybe more productive dialogue? I already actually did it within this interview. I said, oh, for sure, there's policies that I don't agree with, but I find it a little frustrating that I have to start with that so many times. I have to say, I don't agree with everything that China does in order to make it where people are willing to talk to me. Because the moment I say anything good about China, I must be this hardcore sympathizer, you know, must be a Wu Mao, you know. Wu Mao Dan, right? (laughs) Yes, exactly, exactly. 50 cent party. But... Normally what I find works is if I'm face-to-face with someone, I let them talk, let them get their thoughts out. I listen because normally what happens is people who are very opinionated expect there to be conflict. So they come at you with the expectation that there's going to be a fight, with the expectation there's going to be an argument. So I let them get it out of their system first. Once they find out I studied China, they come at me with a lot of vitriol and they're like, oh, China is the worst place ever. It's so horrible. Okay, they get it out. And then I say, that's really interesting. You feel that way. I would love to answer some of your questions about China and maybe I can help you better understand things. Once they realize I'm not there to fight them, they immediately start asking questions because like I said before, so much of this information isn't accessible. And time and time again, I have found that people are often more curious than they are hateful. Their anger or their distaste for something comes from a lack of knowledge. And the moment you start answering their questions in a calm, collected manner, the environment changes. I feel it's my responsibility with the studying that I've done and the work that I do now to be able to answer these questions as best as I can on the fly and not make people feel scared to ask questions. I'm happy to answer questions, even if they're asked in a way that might be problematic. My responsibility is to answer them and to try and help them better understand things. So I'm curious to know, like actually having learned Chinese, how has that helped you and be able to create some of these videos, but also gain access to certain types of maybe information that you wouldn't have access to otherwise? It has helped people trust me more. So more often than not, when you go on social media, YouTube, TikTok, what have you, people that talk about China, they often don't speak Chinese. Yeah, that's true. They find that talking about China gets them a lot of views, so that's their content. Sometimes they'll make a good video, but normally it tends to be very surface level and there's not an in-depth understanding of how things work. If you want to understand China, you have to understand everything. It's all connected. I find that the fact that I'm able to speak Chinese as bad as my Chinese can be at times, a lot of my followers who are Chinese, they trust me because of that. They know she understands China. She's trying. She's been to China. She understands the language. She's going to Chinese sources. She's really trying to understand our side of things and to help present our perspective. And that means a lot to people. So my language abilities, it creates a level of trust and comfortability that wouldn't be there otherwise because the listeners can't see this but I am (laughs) very clearly a white woman so there's already a bit of a barrier there where people are wary of it and I totally understand why it's important to me that I make sure to show how much of an effort I am putting in to make sure that I'm understanding these things and that I'm not just doing this for views I'm doing this because I love it and I care about it and I think it's incredibly important What I'll also say is so much of my content is about connections. I'm on TikTok. It's a video platform. So it's my face. And it's important for me to have connections with people. And I think that's another thing that learning Chinese has helped me with is building those connections. So not only does it help people trust me more, it's also helped me meet really interesting people and gain perspectives. So I have a story about that. This happened long before I was on TikTok. I think before TikTok was even a thing. When I graduated from high school, my mom, as a gift, she took me to Paris, which I know. What the heck? (laughs) All right. Yeah, sounds great. Sign me up. I'm not complaining. So we go to Paris, and this whole time, my mom is just 
teasing me about Chinese, you know, wanting me to practice more. Every time we would go into some of these places, we would see Chinese tourists and she'd be like, you should go practice. I'm like, no, I'm not going up to strangers and speaking Chinese. (laughs) And to this day, I'm incredibly anxious about speaking Chinese. And so one time we go into this one tourist shop just outside of the Notre Dame. And inside were these two old Chinese ladies. And they had to have been like Mm. 90. And they were working the tourist shop. And my mom's looking at them, and she's looking at me, looking at them. She goes, Susan, those two ladies, they're Chinese. You should speak Chinese to them. And I was like, Mom, not every Asian person is Chinese. I'm not just going to go up to a stranger and speak Chinese. That's going to end badly. And she's like, no. But she's like, your dad does. Your dad does. does. (laughs) (laughs) Why not you? (laughs) So I was like, no, Mom, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. She said, go do it now. And I was like, fine. So I go walk up to them, and I was like, oh, like very very weird and shaky and their eyes just lit up i have never seen someone look that happy before in my life wow they were so excited and they just immediately started just going off in chinese and i was overwhelmed because i was like i've picked up like three words <laughs> and i got emotional I was like i'm sorry i i don't speak well my chinese is very very bad And they were like, no, it's okay. We speak a little English. They said, I'm so happy to see someone who's learning Chinese. We Mm. never meet people that are learning Chinese. Paris has the largest Chinese diaspora group in Europe. It's like like 600,000 Chinese people. But what they were saying, they were like, no one learns Chinese. Wow. So there's lots of Chinese people, but it's so beautiful to see someone who's trying to learn my language. That means so much. Thank you. And they were so genuine about it. And that was mind boggling to me. I was like, oh, there's this whole world that I'm able to communicate with now that never occurred to me. It was just these doors that suddenly I just opened. Where I was like, I can understand their stories. If I were to study Chinese more, I can sit down and I can know about their life. And they can tell me things that they'd never be able to express in English. And that's happened a couple of times. Like I'll go to the Chinese grocery store here in Miami and I'll really shakily order like some meat in Chinese from the butcher. And he's this, he's an older Chinese guy and same thing, eyes light up and he's so excited to see someone learning the language. It means a lot to people, the effort, even if your Chinese is bad, if they see that you're trying and you're passionate about it, it means the world. And I'll say out of all of the languages, I really do think that Chinese people are some of the warmest, kindest people when it comes to people that are learning. They are very eager to help. Mm -hmm. I've never had a Chinese person be rude to me about my abilities. It's always been so much encouragement. Sometimes I think it's too much encouragement. I know my Chinese isn't great. And they'll be (laughs) like, you're like fluent. I'm like, no, I'm not. But thank Uh, you. They want you to learn the language. They want to make it as easy as possible for you. So that's really nice. That's a story I've heard time and time Mm. again from so many learners. And I've even met people who stopped learning whatever language that they were focusing on at the time and said, hey, I'm going to learn Chinese because they were so encouraging about it. And I definitely think that's something that definitely helps with learner motivation, right? Mm Mm-hmm. I've only had once where some crusty old taxi driver in Shanghai, and I'm like, how long you been here? And I'm like, oh, and I'm like, sorry, my Chinese is, it's really bad. And he's like, yep, it's real bad. Should be a lot better for how long you've been here. Yeah, it's terrible. He was probably drinking for all we know. But anyway, so normal to Shanghai mm-hmm. taxi driver. So I'm curious to know, Susan, from your perspective, you spent some time learning Chinese here, and it sounds like your career still is heavily involved in China, and that's something you really wanted to do. What advice would you give to someone, you know, even advice you would have given to yourself years younger when they're really focused, like, say, hey, I really want to learn the language. I really want to have a career that's connected to China. What kind of advice would you give to someone who has those aspirations? My first piece of advice is do not be discouraged by what people say to you. This journey of me going into a career concentrating in China, there have been challenges where people have been very questioning of my decisions. They'll say, are you sure you want to be doing this? Why are you doing this? You know, what are your motivations? There's a lot of criticism that can be sent your way. And I've been in hot water sometimes where people have made assumptions about my character because of my work trying to help people understand China. They've accused me of sympathizing with with very just terrible things. And it can be difficult dealing with that. So to anyone who wants to go into a career where they're trying to work in the field of Chinese studies, I would let you know that there's a chance that you might have to deal with that. And 
Don't let that be the reason why you don't continue in that journey. Harden yourself up. Make sure you've got thick skin. Always try to understand people first. What matters most is people. Don't let the business stuff, don't let the political stuff overshadow the value of people and talking to people and hearing their perspectives and listening to their voice because that is what helps you build a better picture of everything else. The key is the people. Everything else is an offshoot of that. And if you only study politics, if you only study business or economics, then you will have a very shallow understanding of China and you won't make it anywhere and you won't have the deep connection that you need to be able to last in that field. And what advice would you give to someone who's learning Chinese right now? This is advice that I'm still giving myself. I am a terrible perfectionist, and it cripples me when it comes to my learning abilities. To this day, I have an incredibly hard time speaking Chinese to people because I know everything that I'm doing wrong, and I nitpick. So if it's not perfect, I won't do it. Don't do that. Like I've said before, Chinese people are so kind when it comes to language learners. They want you to do well, and they will help you. Don't be worried that it, if you speak Chinese to someone that they're going to snap at you or, or, or say something rude. Normally, they will be incredibly friendly and they'll help you. Don't be shy. Don't be anxious. Just go do it because you will never get better if you don't speak. You won't. <laughs> That's what I'm learning right now. I've been studying Chinese for over 11 years and I've had a hard time speaking. And guess what? I'm way behind. I should be far more fluent than I am because I was so scared of speaking for so long. So don't be intimidated. Try and get out of that comfort zone and just go out there. If you embarrass yourself, you're, you'll be fine. You're not going to die. <laughs> you'll live another day and you'll get better and better until eventually you're beautifully fluent and you never embarrass yourself again. <laughs> never, 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 ever, ever, ever. ever. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a chance, right? Susan, maybe you could tell us about where people could find out a little more about you and any of the projects that you're working on right now. For sure. So if you want to watch my TikTok videos, I recommend you follow China Vibe Official. That is the TikTok that I run for the China Project. On that channel, you can learn all about Chinese politics, news, and culture. And every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we have a live stream show where me and my coworker, Jia Yun, talk about all of the latest news coming out of China, and we do a weekly summary. It's a ton of fun. I highly recommend you check that out. You can sign up for that live streaming show on the China Vibe official account. You'll see the link as soon as you pull it up on the platform. I will also direct people towards a conference that I am currently building. So I am working with a couple of other people to build the China America Student Conference. So this is a conference for college students mm. that are interested in U.S.-China relations. It is a very unique conference. I have never seen a conference that is like this one. What we are doing is bringing 10 students from the United States and 10 students from China together to talk about U.S.-China relations in a personal context to try and build leaders in the field, starting with young people. That conference is going to be taking place from June 5th to June 17th. We are going to be traveling to New York City and Washington, D.C. We have lots of amazing speakers lined up. And if you'd like to join that conference or if you know someone that would be interested in being in that conference, shoot me an email. I'll give you all the information and you can sign up for that conference. Great. It's going to be a ton of fun. And we could put a link to that in the show notes. So if anyone's interested, they can be able to find it a little easier. Well, hey, Susan, it's been so wonderful here to talk to you about your story. And I really appreciate you taking the time to share your experience and, you know, your insights with us. It's been great to hear this. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. It was a ton of fun. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, event planner, photographer, engineer, minister, bowler, singer, painter, and that one gal named Natalie. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at MandarinCompanion.com or tag us on social media, hashtag MandarinCompanion. Apologies to John Cena, we just ran out of time. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself, Jared Turner, and our editor is Kaiser Kuo. And interview editor is Dominic Edgley. I'd like to thank our special guest, Susan St. Dennis, and of course, thanks to my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Pass. See you next time.